I'm going to introduce Dr. Cassidy Clausen, who is currently in Zambia working with CHEV. He has an MD and an MPH, and he's been very involved in infectious disease. And I'm going to ask him to introduce the rest of his panel. And thank you all for staying for the session. Thank you, Ms. Rose. And good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, those of you who have stayed for the session. We're looking forward to this chat. Uh, we have decided to keep this short and interactive. We anticipated that everyone would be tired uh, here at the end of the day. Um, so we're going to, I'm going to take us through just a few slides for, fling, for framing the context. And then we have an extremely distinguished panel here that we're very lucky to have. And I've asked them all to prepare a few brief remarks on what they do. And then we'll go from there to open it up to questions from the audience on, on avenues for potential collaborations in the field of global antibiotic resistance. So just a few words on anti antimicrobial resistance. It is a, a global threat that is present already and stands to become a greater threat as time goes on. By 2050, we're estimated, currently we have 700,000 deaths that are attributed to AMR currently. By 2050, that is expected to rise to 10 million per year. And the losses to the economy associated with this are quite tremendous. Uh, currently, it's quite significant, but by 2050, anticipated to be over $100 trillion. Worldwide, the problem of antimicrobial resistance is not concentrated in resource-rich settings, despite this being the place of, of many of the antibiotics themselves. Uh, rather, it's the overall largest number anticipated is in Asia, but per capita, the highest concentration is in Africa, where by 2050, we expect a mortality uh, of over 4 million people annually. According to the Global Antibiotic Resistance Surveillance System report of 2018, uh, which looked at over half a million isolates from 22 countries, uh, already as of currently we have bloodstream infections where up to even 82% of, of bloodstream infections are resistant to the first line antibiotic therapy. Uh, e. coli and urinary tract infections prevalences of resistance to Cipro currently are estimated anywhere on the low end of 8% but as high as 65%, which is, which is very concerning. Um, in South Korea, for example, over 75% of acinidobacter isolates were found to be resistant to carbapenems, and in Malawi, over 90% of Nasseria gonorrhea was resistant to ceftriaxone. Painting the picture that uh, it's a current threat and stands to be a, an ever-emerging one. There are mo many reasons why AMR is an intractable problem and in many ways poses a, a more complex threat than the, some of the other epidemics we've helped combat in the past, such as the, the HIV epidemic. Um, some of the, the things that go into AMR include, of course, inappropriate usage of antibiotics by physicians, uh, such as many of us in the room, um, overprescribing or underprescribing of antibiotics. And often we see in, in resource-limited settings, such as Zambia, where we work, that many antibiotics are sold on the street, uh, so people may take them for a short course and inadequate duration of therapy. Um, we have, in many places, weak pharmaceutical quality assurance systems, so we may manufacture substandard drugs or store them improperly, resulting in decreased potency. Of course, taking the one health approach, there is an overuse of antibiotics in animal husbandry. We find traces of antibiotics throughout the environment, which then breeds, you know, the bacteria don't care where it comes from, they breed resistance to it wherever they find it. Uh, we have poor inve infection prevention and control practices in many parts of the world, and there are weak surveillance systems that, are, that can be used to monitor antibiotic resistance. Finally, there's a limited pipeline of future therapeutics, so we're not going to discover our way out of this problem. It's one we have to face on our own. So this brings me, having, having described the threat, this brings me to the opportunities that we have here today. And I want to point out that at University of Maryland, this is a recognized world leader in many fields pertaining to antibiotic stewardship. 
we have world-class excellence in infection prevention, in infectious disease pharmacy, of course, in infectious disease as a practice of medicine, and in, in, in uh, antibiotic stewardship. So the, the, the real goal of today's session is then to consider how we have this UMB excellence here in this field, but has really been historically concentrated to the domestic arena, how we can leverage that now to our global footprint, where we are, in many of the countries we work in, known for clinical and service delivery, and clinical excellence in what we do, and we have historically you know, been boots on the ground, doctors and nurses, training the next generation and mentoring the current generation. So we have a, a clinical presence and are often well respected in these areas in which we work. So there's a unique opportunity to leverage the experts that are here on stage with me today into the countries we work, into, we work in and use that to collaborate and create new synergy. So I'll close with just a, a, a brief overview of what we're doing in Zambia. Um, in 2016, Dr. Brenna Roth, who is going to speak next on this project in further depth, uh, came to Zambia as a fellow, and that's Dr. Achangwa standing there. And we began a project with her, a research project looking at current patterns of anti antibiotic resistance at University Teaching Hospital, which is where Dr. Achangwa and I both work as clinical mentors for the residents there. Then in 2017, 2018, we received funding uh, from the University of Maryland for the, from the uh, Center for Global Education Initiatives from uh, Virginia Rothwell and Bonnie Bissonnette uh, to help fund pharmacy professors, uh, Drs. Emily Heil and Neha Shah, to come to Zambia and work with us to start assessing antibiotic utilization. And this is, uh, we're pictured here with a medical student and a pharmacy student that was there last year. And from this work, we've been characterizing what antibiotics are in use and measuring the effect of that. And putting this together, we now have a, a manuscript going to press on current patterns of resistance seen at, at, at UTH and current patterns of antibiotic usage. Uh, it, using this information, we hope to combine it into a future guideline for antibiotics in Zambia, now that we understand the organisms and we understand the antibiotics. And having established this baseline, we'll be able to work with the hospital to establish antibiotic stewardship practices and so forth so that we can monitor effective reduction of overusage of antibiotics. And hopefully this can serve as a model for uh, other hospitals in Zambia and the nation as uh, effective antibiotic usage in, in the region. Uh, finally, in 2019, just last week actually, so these slides are very current, uh, we had Dr. Christy Johnson, along with Dr. Devon Patel, come out for a one-week teaching session, and Dr. Johnson was able to work with the microbiology lab, and we're starting to set up a collaboration there that we hope will uh, stretch into the future. So, those are my, my comments. We have um, a, a very distinguished panel here today. I'm going to ask first uh, Dr. Brenna Roth to come up, and she, uh, I'll introduce everyone now, and then... Um, We'll, we'll go through, the, we'll hear them speak. Uh, Dr. Roth completed her ID fellowship here at the University of Maryland in 2017. And her research project at that time looked at this AMR in, at UTH. Since then, she's been a visiting instructor at the University of Maryland and works in Tanzania, where she is the clinical lead for the HIV Clinical ECHO Project. And she also works, um, it provides clinical mentorship in HIV care and treatment. She's currently working on a research project with the University of Maryland Medicine and Pharmacy Departments on AMR at, in Tanzania. Um, what are you, I'll introduce people in three months. Go ahead. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So, um, as Cassie just said, just said, um, I won't go into more detail on, on antimicrobial resistance in Africa, but what it really comes down to is there's actually very limited uh, data. However, every indication, as he said, is that it is a very real public health problem there as well as everywhere. So um, there are a lot of factors, which he also hit on, that some of them are very similar to those in the U.S., but others are sort of unique to the context in 
in Africa, such as antibiotics being very available over the counter, easily accessible, which leads to a lot of overuse and probably misprescribing and misuse. So this complexity of factors really contributes to this, this problem, and as a result, you need a lot of expertise. And as Cassie's been working on in Zambia, there you have pharmacy students, you have microbiology, you have physicians, and we're really trying to, the hope is that we take a similar approach in, in Tanzania. Um, the project I did in Zambia was really focused on getting baseline data, but at the same time, the desire was to have a practical component to it. So we actually did develop a, a, um, an antibiogram. And the, the hope was that clinicians would be able to use that to uh, treat infections empirically, either while they're waiting for microbiology data or in cases where they may not end up with exact information on what was causing an infection. And I, I think it's really important because you do see a lot of work being done uh, looking at the extent of antimicrobial resistance in Africa, and, that, and that's certainly very important. And it's critical to, to strengthen the systems to look at that and to, to be able to do regular surveillance, because these studies a lot of times are kind of a, a one, one shot in time, and they're not necessarily ongoing surveillance. But at the same time, you also need these practical tools for clinicians to use, such as antibiograms. You need better education. And I think that that's really where University of Maryland, Baltimore can serve as, as an excellent collaborator, because there's a lot of skills and infrastructure that just don't necessarily exist right now in a lot of these countries. I certainly can't speak for every country, but I know Tanzania is, is very early in its, uh, in its attempts to address antimicrobial resistance. Um, there has been a big study looking at the, t that has developed Tanzania's National Action Plan on AMR, and they've also developed a, a national surveillance plan for AMR, but this is still very early, and um, I, th there's still definitely a lot of work to be done, and I think that's where University of Maryland, Baltimore can can be very helpful in collaborating. So that's all. Thank you, Brenna. Uh, next, I'd like to introduce Dr. Anthony Harris. Uh, Dr. Harris is a professor here at the University of Maryland School of Medicine. He has over 200 publications in the field of antibiotic resistance and healthcare associated infections. Most of his work has been done related to domestic problems in the U.S., and he has current funding from the NIH, CDC, and AHRQ. He is the former president of the Society for Healthcare Epidemiology of America, and he is PI on the Center of Excellence grant from the CDC, of which only, exi only 11 exist in the United States. Uh, and this, this uh, center focuses on ways to prevent the emergence of antibody resistance bacteria. Please welcome Dr. Harris. Thanks very much. Um, and change it up a little bit. Um, so I think Cassie outlined the key point that I'm gonna just give a little bit of background in the uh, next two minutes on this is I think the group that, um, that I'm honored to basically um, be division head of has a lot of the core issues um, and core skills that can be used to expand to study antibiotic resistance and infection control in particular um, in emerging areas. And um, as Cassidy alluded to, I think the key point is, is if we're really going to make a difference in the emergence of antibiotic resistance, we need to think broader. Now, what Cassidy did allude to, if you look at most of my group up to this point, we've done most of our work domestically. Um, and have not done international work, but I think we're well equipped to kind of expand that. So our group has 11 faculty members. We're kind of a mix of physicians who have epidemiologic training, mostly masters of science and MPHs, and we also have um, a core of PhD epidemiologists. We're housed in the Department of Epidemiology and School of Public Health. And the joke I tell that unfortunately is true is, is when we were interested in infection control in the late 90s, we used to literally report to the janitor. 
So when we went to quality meetings and infection control reports were on, we were always last on the agenda. And the thing was, oh, not enough time to get to infection control. And I think over the 20 years that we've been doing this, now all of a sudden, I think people are starting to realize the importance of infection control, basically, to get a grasp of, of antibiotic resistance. Um, so some of the things I wanted to highlight, basically, are, um, as was alluded to, um, most of our work, basically, has been on a lot of aspects of infection control. So it's how do emerging pathogens in the hospital and non-hospital setting arise, what are the best ways and best interventions to prevent their spread. Um, our group's been studying these questions for over 20 years. We also have a lot of expertise in day-to-day -day infection control. So our group runs infection control at the University of Maryland Medical Center, serves as a consultant for all the hospitals in the system, and runs infection control at the VA. Um, initially, a lot of our work was done kind of single center, but we've expanded. So we have, we're in charge of the largest infection control fellows course across the United States. We also have had um, numerous positions in a society you may not have heard of called the Society of Healthcare Epidemiology of America. It has about 2,000 members. So there are three or four people in our group who've been head of pretty much every committee um, in that society, so president of the society, head of the guidelines and policy committee, head of the education committee. And the only reason I mention that is, is you can see that in all the areas potentially you may want to expand to in developing countries relative to resistance, whether it's education, whether it's surveillance, whether it's research, we kind of um, have that expertise. The other project that's really exciting that um, a number of us are doing, it's mainly being led by Dr. Serbi Lika, is we're trying to control and have been partnering with the state on um, statewide control. So Surrey's basically leading an initiative, partnering with Johns Hopkins and the state health department to um, control C. diff across all the facilities in the state of Maryland. And the knowledge that's kind of been gained by that kind of um, project, I think, um, can be learned and applied um, on a more global scale. We also have expertise in day-to-day -day infection control. So um, fortunately or unfortunately, similar to the comments that were made this morning, a Friday afternoon call relative to an emergency that's occurring in an ambulatory surgery center or one of the neonatal ICUs is something that um, we often get and Christy Johnson often gets in the micro lab similarly. So I think just to summarize, um, we have expertise in education, research, um, and day-to-day and -day infection control that we think can be applied to this um, really growing problem, as Cassidy alluded to, of antibiotic resistance on a global level. And um, thanks for inviting me. Thank you, Dr. Harris. Uh, next, I'd like to introduce Professor Christy Johnson. Uh, Dr. Johnson is a professor here at the University of Maryland School of Medicine in the Departments of Pathology and Epidemiology and Public Health and Microbiology and Immunology. <laughs> and also the Director of the Clinical Microbiology and Virology Laboratories at the University of Maryland Medical Center. Uh, Dr. Johnson is a diplomat of the American Board of Medical Microbiology and ha has expertise in public health and medical microbiology. Her research focuses on detection, transmission, and control of antimicrobial-resistant organisms, concentrating primarily on methicillin-resistant Staph aureus, MRSA, and resistant gram-negative bacteria, which include the MDR uh, enterobacteriaceae, such as KPCs, ESBLs, and plasmid-mediated MCs, Acinetobacter baumani, and of course, Pseudomonas aeginosa. So please welcome Dr. Johnson, thank you. Good afternoon, and thank you for inviting me to be here. So I just want to highlight two of the areas that I'm really interested in. Um, so I collaborate with everyone on this panel looking at infection control methods, transmission of bacteria, but really my passion is as a clinical microbiologist. And so for us to be able to look at the epidemiology and to look at the transmission of um, antimicrobial resistance, we actually have to be able to detect it. So um, I spend time and have grant, um, grants funded in the area of um, detection. So I just wanted to highlight two. 
I've had a shepherd grant through the CDC, which is um, an epidemiological uh, grant system through CDC, where I collect isolates from around the US. And we collect not only um, antimicrobial resistant isolates, but as well as sensitive isolates. So we look at the gram negatives, like Pseudomonas and Acinetobacter and our Interbacteriaceae. We look at gram positives, like Enercoccus and Staph aureus. And what we're doing is we're collecting these isolates from around the US, where different labs use different methods for detection of bacterial identification. They use different methods for susceptibility testing. And we bring them all back to one lab. We do reference susceptibility testing. We perform molecular um, identification, antimicrobial resistance detection, and we really want to see how well can we identify bacteria that are either um, antimicrobial resistant or susceptible to the drugs that we are using in the hospitals. So from some of this data, what we've seen is that hospitals overcall resistance. Um, by some of the automated instruments that they use when they're performing susceptibility. So um, one of the emerging resistant organisms that we think about are carbapenem-resistant Intrabacteriaceae. And what we found is that about 13% of the isolates we received in which a hospital told us that it was a carbapenem-resistant was actually carbapenem-susceptible. Um, and so therefore, our clinicians are using drugs that they don't need to use because we are not able to detect um, that an organism is actually susceptible or overcalling resistance. Um, another area I wanted to highlight um, was that um, I've been going around globally and teaching on antimicrobial susceptibility testing. I am part of the Clinical and Laboratory Standards Institute, which is a nonprofit um, institution in the United States that focuses on um, giving guidelines to clinical laboratories, not just in microbiology, but in chemistry, molecular um, diagnostics as well. And I sit as a member of the Methods and Interpretation Working Group on their Antimicrobial Susceptibility Testing Committee. And so I have been spending time um, going around to different labs in low resource countries and educating them on how to perform susceptibility testing, um, how to know which method. Um, there's a lot of information out in the literature on which method we should be using, um, making sure that they're using the correct media. So if you use a different media, um, then you might not get the correct um, interpretation of the susceptibility testing. So I was fortunate enough to be invited to Zambia um, and got to spend the last week in their microbiology laboratory. And it was mentioned earlier that um, you learn a lot. It's not always us teaching people, but you also learn. And I learned a lot um, in their laboratory. I was able to see how they are um, identifying the bacteria and as well as performing susceptibility testing. Um, I've been able to um, go to places like um, India, where we gave workshops on how to perform susceptibility testing, how to interpret, how to make an antibiogram, which we talked about a little while ago, um, so that clinicians can use that information to give appropriate um, antibiotics. Dr. Johnson. Uh, next, I'd like to welcome uh, Dr. Daniel Morgan. Uh, Dan Morgan is Chief Hospital Epidemiologist at the Baltimore VA and a fellow at the Center for Disease Dynamics, Economics, and Policy. He has over 130 publications. His research focuses on infection prevention and medical overuse. And he was also a founding member and the past director of the Society for Healthcare Epidemiology of America Research Network. And he was on the board of directors of SHEA. Uh, he is currently on an NIH New Innovator Award that is allowing him to explore how poor clinical understanding of risk can lead to medical overuse. Please welcome Dr. Morgan. Okay. Well, thanks, thanks, everyone. I'm humbled to be here um, with you. And um, I'm just going to, I I'd certainly echo what Anthony and Christy said as far as like what our group does a lot of. We do a lot with antibiotic resistance and we do a lot with how to prevent infections, primarily in the hospital, nursing home, a little bit in the outpatient setting. 
Um, so that's kind of the bread and butter of what we do, which has almost exclusively been done in the U.S. with only kind of occasional surveys or other things more, more internationally. Um, and it's great to have so many people here who are actually working in country, because from my limited experience, certainly it's, it's been clear that it's hard to, uh, to change systems anywhere that you are, and especially if you're trying to work internationally, it's hard to change systems in a place where, you know, there's not a clear connection or not a clear um, uh, long-term relationship. So I, I think that is key. Um, just a few things I'll throw out. Um, as Anthony mentioned, um, you know, there's a lot of good people in our group who do a lot with education and mentoring. Uh, Mary Claire Rogman and Carrie Tom are two people who I don't think were mentioned who have done a lot with education um, in those areas and also relating to antibiotic resistance. Um, my uh, sort of interest in international type work goes back to probably 15 years ago when I spent a few years living in Brazil doing training for infectious diseases. Um, and can certainly identify with the idea that Rio de Janeiro and Baltimore have some things in, in common as far as uh, different conditions for the health there. Um, when I came back, I started working on um, some uh, summaries of uh, an over-the-counter antibiotic use, which as we've heard mentioned by Brenna and others is common in much of the developing world, certainly in, in Asia, Africa, and Latin America. For the majority of countries, it's, it's still a fairly common phenomenon. That led to working with uh, Ramanan Laxmanarian, who's an economist at the Centers for Disease Dynamics, Economics, and Policy, um, who's done a lot, I think, to try to popularize the idea that um, we really need to have global involvement in um, countrywide goals for antibiotic use. Um, and so I work with him some. Um, and then on New Innovator Award, I'm working on visualizing risk and clinical decisions and some online educational tools and uh, using graphic design and that kind of thing to try to improve clinician understanding of uh, appropriateness of, of treatment. And, and then finally, with uh, Serbi Lika in our group, we've tried to work on uh, defining diagnostic stewardship. So the idea of trying to use tests more smartly, um, often using things like behavioral economics type approaches to kind of guide clinicians into the, the, probably the best use of tests. Um, when we sometimes overuse them or underuse them um, in day-to-day -day decisions. So I'll just throw that out, um, interested in talking to uh, you know, people um, during this panel or after. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Morgan. Uh, next, I'd like to invite Dr. Sharon Tennant. Uh, Dr. Tennant is a Associate Professor of Medicine at the Center for Vaccine Development and Global Health here at the University of Maryland School of Medicine. She develops vaccines against non-typhoidal salmonella, as well as nosocomial pathogens such as Klebsiella pneumonae and Pseudomonas aeruginosa. Additionally, she oversees the CBD molecular diagnostic section in Clinical Microbiology Laboratory, and Dr. Tennant provides microbiology and molecular biology support for the clinical trials that are performed domestically as well as internationally. In particular, she, focuses, she participates in field studies to identify the main causes of infection in developing countries. She's interested in understanding antimicrobial resistance in these populations, as well as developing new strategies to counteract antibiotic resistant bacteria. Please welcome Dr. Tennant. Thank you, Cassidy. So I'm a microbiologist and molecular biologist from training. I did my PhD in bacterial pathogenesis. And here at the Center for Vaccine Development, I mainly work on salmonella, um, develop vaccines and diagnostic assays, and more recently have been developing vaccines against Klebsiella and Pseudomonas. So our strategy to counteract <clears throat> any microbial resistance is to try to prevent the infections from happening in the first place by developing vaccines. Um, in terms of my global health research, I am um, I developed diagnostic assays that we have evaluated in, in Pakistan um, and interested in understanding what um, mainly bacteria, but sometimes viruses, um, cause disease mainly in children under the age of five. I uh, have worked in Kenya, Mali, uh, the Gambia, um, and work very closely with uh, Dr. Kotloff, uh, Dr. So, uh, <coughs> um, uh, Millie Tapia, um, and many others in the, the CBD. <coughs> in terms of um, antimicrobial resistance, um, we have 
um, gathered a lot of, of bacteria um, from our field studies and are now starting to examine antibiotic resistance. Um, so, for example, we have um, um, isolates collected from um, more than 10 years from uh, Kenya, Mali and the Gambia and are now starting to look at trends over time to try and fill some of those, um, those gaps that he acknowledged that people mentioned earlier. Um, and you know, that just all helps to uh, add to our uh, understanding of these bacteria and where we really need to um, direct our efforts. Um, that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Uh, last but hardly least, uh, I'd like to welcome uh, Dr. Kristen Stafford. Uh, Dr. Stafford is an assistant professor at the University of Maryland School of Medicine in the Department of Ep Epidemiology and Public Health. She has 25 years of experience in the field of public health, including 15 in international settings. Uh, she's an infectious disease epidemiologist and an early stage investigator whose contributions to antibiotic resistance literature focused on epidemiologic methods used in AMR research, including confounding by indication in non-randomized studies of antibiotics, risk adjustment methods, quasi-experimental design, considerations for cluster randomized trials, and investigating transmission risk factors. Dr. Stafford is also the Director of Clinical Research Education Programs in the Department of Epidemiology and Public Health, where she leads the Master of Science and Certificate in Clinical Research Program. She's also Associate Director for the Center uh, for Center of National Health Education and Biosecurity here in Houston, Maryland. Please welcome Dr. Stafford. Hi, everybody. So as an epidemiologist, what I like to do is connect the dots, I mean, hopefully causally. Um, but what I'm going to try and do now is try and connect the dots with what this panel talked about and what we're doing internationally. Um, because I think we hope what one of the major outcomes of this uh, panel and the workshop part of it where people can talk about what's happening is what are the next steps. So when I joined the University of Maryland in 2004, the tagline for the School of Medicine was Teach, Heal, Discover. And I still tend to think about what we do in terms of teach, heal, discover. So some of the things we talked about, um, you know, Cassidy set this up quite nicely with just the magnitude of the problem. How, how big the burden is mortality-wise, morbidity-wise, cost-wise, and those kinds of things. And then, so, you know, what do we do with those things? What does a clinician do in the face of limited evidence when they're looking at a patient who is sick, um, who has an infection, they don't know what it is? What does a hospital do in these settings? How do, how do they address some of these things? What does a Ministry of Health do to address the, the problems of antimicrobial resistance? And when you look across the panel here in terms of the different areas of expertise, whether it's research dealing with prevention of transmission, uh, whether it's education of virologists or microbiologists or epidemiologists or, or pharmacists and other physicians, um, whether it's boots on the grounds, infectious disease clinicians, which we have in each of these countries, who are trying to address issues of stewardship, who are trying to address um, challenges with just the unfettered access to antimicrobials in most of these settings. Um, you know, how does this all kind of bridge together? And so part of what I wanted to talk about, because this is kind of my two lives colliding, I spent a good part of my career in, in HIV, my connection to this group is, and Dr. Harris was one of my mentors during my PhD, and I actually sit in his division. That's, that's where my academic appointment is. So I'm lucky enough to actually get to sit at their research meetings on a weekly basis, and every now and then they, you know, will tolerate my talks about, you know, my comments on study design and, and appropriate comparisons and, and things like that. But so the methodological piece, and there's a, there's a couple of colleagues, part of my role since coming back into the international division, I think, is also making sure that those of you that we work with overseas benefit from some of the relationships that those of us are here get to develop and get to develop somewhat deeply. Um, so there's a couple of researchers actually in the, in the audience that, that I work with um, who are also interested in partnering in these things. So Dr. Lindsay O'Hara, for instance, is also an early stage investigator in our division. She has international um, experience in TB in particular, but is faculty in, in Anthony's division and is working in these and is open to these collaborations. Um, we're lucky enough in CHEB to have recruited away uh, Natalia Blanco, who post doc with, with Anthony and has expertise in this area, and now she's contributing to the CHEB portfolio. 
Um, when, when we look at what we can do in, in terms of the global health impact that the University of Maryland can have, and we look at all of the different opportunities that are presenting themselves um, in each of the countries we work with and in others that we're not yet working in. In Nigeria, for example, one of the countries I work with very, very closely, um, part of our surveillance grant in that country, and I, Ali, you mentioned it um, when he presented on the country program, is actually trying to develop the surveillance system to just look at antimicrobial consumption, something that they don't have a baseline on. And one of the things we've done is actually developed a tool, an, an, a little phone-based app that um, individuals in remote hospitals and clinics can submit this information. So the data is starting to come in. But that surveillance need is, is getting stronger and stronger and stronger across all these countries as they see the day-to-day -day morbidity and mortality burden of antimicrobial resistance. Um, so a couple of the other things, the major themes that came through, you know, when you've got um, a, a somewhat perfect storm of no stewardship, um, unreliable or limited data on what the actual selective pressures are for, for different bugs, um, whether the right drugs are being used for the right bugs, um, if their laboratory is even operational, if they know how to interpret the susceptibility um, results. Um, what do they do when they're actually laying hands on a patient? When we, what's the surveillance data look like? When we look at this together and we look at the magnitude of what the University of Maryland has, I think most of the purpose of this workshop is trying to create some of those connections and making sure people think about the expertise that's here. And it doesn't necessarily mean that we're going to pick Anthony's division up and send it to you know, the middle of sub-Saharan Africa. But it does mean that when countries like Rwanda want to do some of the first surveillance on what does the antimicrobial resistance pattern look like at particular hospitals, there are experts to talk about, about the correct way to actually design that study. How do you do it so you make sure that the evidence you're collecting is good evidence, that you're making the right comparisons, that you're sampling the proper way, that you're, you're getting it from a representative sample in the hospital, and that your laboratory diagnostics are, are telling you what they're supposed to tell you. Um, and again, on the education side, as we've heard throughout um, the, the talks today, there are a number of opportunities for education to occur without needing to fly people overseas. So thinking about how we can incorporate some of this expertise, whether it's through ECHO and the communities of practice that it can create, or through dedicated educational opportunities with some of the, the stuff that Dr. Burry talked about and some of the things that the Center for International Education are doing. So that's some of it. So I think, again, it really does come back to the, the connect the dots on this is what the University of Maryland can do to teach, heal, discover around antimicrobial resistance. Thank you, Dr. Stafford. So at this point, uh, I think you've seen the breadth of experience here. To my colleagues at NC have posted around the world, you know, I think there's a remarkable uh, uh, depth here that we can, you know, we can access and, and approach to replicate studies or conduct our new studies in the sites where we work and we support. And on that note, I'd like to, uh, so I'd like to open it up to questions and comments from the audience. I'd like to invite uh, Dr. Takala Harrison to maybe say a few comments about the work she's doing and the, the training grant she's applying for. I don't have an introduction prepared for that. Um, sure. Thank you. Um, I think this is a great panel, and most of the members of the panel I have invited to serve as training faculty on a D43 um, training grant to increase AMR research capacity in Mali. Uh, I'm working closely with Dr. Salma So and investigators within Anthony's division as well as the CVD and Institute for Genome Sciences, uh, CVD Mali, and the University of Sciences Techniques and Technologies of Bamako. The goal of the grant is, is really to um, provide doctoral and postdoctoral training to investigators in Mali who have an interest in AMR and to um, also provide career development training for Malian investigators who are already interested in AMR research and, and 
provide some training that will help them continue to build their research programs. So the, the topic areas for that proposal are aligned with the WHO uh, Global Action Plan and, in, and include um, uh, research focuses on epidemiology of antimicrobial resistance, uh, genetics and genomics of AMR pathogens, and also um, uh, development and testing of vaccines against AMR pathogens. So I'd, I'd like to thank the, the panel members and other faculty members who have agreed to um, share their expertise with, with investigators in Mali, and I, I hope we will get to work together as part of this grant. Hello, um, they just wanted me to mention um, uh, after Shannon talked that I also am applying for a D71, which is the grant before the D43. Um, it's a one-year training, uh, training, it's a one-year planning grant um, to apply for the five-year training grant. Um, so I am collaborating um, with uh, faculty in Kenya at uh, Canary. Um, and we are um, just starting um, to look at um, antimicrobial resistance in Kenya and how we can also bring training to um, the faculty there, bring them here, um, or have us go there and train on um, master's degrees, uh, PhDs, uh, postdoctoral fellows um, between the University of Maryland. Um, and we also have a lot of people on this panel that will be uh, mentors for that uh, training. Any questions from the audience? I have a comment and a question. Um, so from the malaria perspective, and those of you who work in malaria endemic countries will understand this, we started recognizing, uh, Don and I are uh, co-mentoring a junior faculty member who did an analysis looking at what happened when rapid diagnostic tests for malaria were introduced in Malawi. And this was really an issue mostly in children who generally, if you had a fever, and didn't have signs of pneumonia, you were diagnosed with malaria and given antimalarials. And they developed, um, developed uh, malaria rapid diagnostic tests and you could do a test. And in Malawi, we have found out about two thirds of those cases of people who looked like they had malaria didn't have malaria. In other places, it was even less than that. And so we exchanged over prescription of antimalarials for over prescription of antibiotics. So about 50% of those people who looked like they had malaria but had a negative test were diagnosed with sepsis and given Bactrim. And every single organism, every single invasive pathogen that's been studied in Malawi, or most of the invasive pathogens studied in Malawi are resistant to Bactrim. So either they didn't have sepsis, which most of the time they didn't, or they were given the wrong drug. So I think it, it's very clear that some sort, that not only do we need to figure out the appropriate use of antibiotics? But one of the big challenges is diagnostics, which brings me to the question of, which I've been struggling with because I've been thinking about this a lot with Shannon. How do you do antimicrobial resistance surveillance in settings where almost no one has access to diagnostics? So you can certainly be at UTH <laughs> and see and have a functioning microbiology lab. But my guess is that the vast majority of people, even with severe invasive bacterial infections, don't have access to diagnostics. And how do you, how do you approach that? I know there's not one answer, but it's a question. For the, for the. I can give you an example of what has recently happened in Nigeria. Um, so the, the head of the Nigerian CDC um, actually asked us if we would take a region um, of the country and go in and do an assessment of all of their diagnostic capacity currently. Um, told them we'd be happy to if we found the funding for it, but they, they don't know either, right? So I think, I think 
I'm giving you a general context for it in another country, and then the people who actually know how to do the diagnostics will talk about it. But um, it's, a, it's a question that we're getting from the highest levels of government in the countries that we work in, um, is, is how do we actually do this, and how do we know that the diagnostics we're using are actually accurate? You know, what is the sensitivity of some of these things that we're using? What is the specificity of some of these tests that we're using? But um, so just to, just to kind of tee up the, the question for, for the folks with the lab expertise, you know, the ministries of health are starting to ask us, can you come in and figure out um, what we're doing right and what we're doing wrong? I mean, I, yeah. I mean this is a, yeah. just sort of an opinion, not a, you know, my experience on boots on the ground for this type of thing. But uh, I mean, I think that uh, diagnostics are often difficult, even in the U.S., to apply to individual patients, and they often follow after you've already done treatment at the most critical period. You know, you treat people, and then you get test results back later. Um, and that they're probably, a, a, with sort of organized, structured approaches to trying to survey the community and, and make certain that you're doing appropriate testing, but get a sense for different syndromes, either in the community or the hospital, and sort of what would be the recommended kind of first-line agents, probably similar to, to malaria or other things, where it's hard to actually test each patient for each thing, but trying to, to, to develop um, approaches that are localized to, to their communities or countries to at least have appropriate kind of empiric treatment up front. I have two other ideas, Miriam, but again, the other people's answers are probably more um, more eloquent or, or, or um, thoughtful than this, but I think what you're getting at is, is you're saying you're in a country where diagnostic testing isn't the standard, but they're trying to get a grasp of what the magnitude of the problem is. I think there's two main approaches I would suggest. One is ties into basic FE, right, which is do sampling frequency, right? So try to determine if you had a better test, right? How many would you need to sample and what would your confidence interval need to be to get an estimate you know, on a population level. So one approach would be you would write a grant, right, and you would say, okay, I'm going to either collect these specimens and send them to the U.S., or I'm going to provide the equipment to the place, and I'm going to sample, and I'm going to sample thoughtfully, and I'm going to calculate what the confidence intervals around that is, and I'm going to do it in that fashion. I think another approach relative to antibiotic <coughs> resistance that um, we've successfully done on the state level, and um, I think other organizations have, have talked about is um, it ties into the tip of the iceberg, right? So once you have clinical cultures that show a res certain resistance profile, ahead of that curve is what the patient's colonized with, especially for certain bacteria. So the people that are colonized with certain res in, um, resistant bacteria in their intestinal flora or their microbiota, those are the organisms that are going to get. Um, infected with. So as an example in the ICU shows that about 30% of the cultures that you end up getting, the patient has the same pathogen in their thing. So was that long-winded um, preamble lead to a suggestion? Is a suggestion that you can do from a research point of view and that we have done at the state is, as an example, we had a hypothesis of what, you know, what percent of patients who are ventilated in the state have a resistant acinetobacter. And we did over a two-week um, two-week period, we basically did a series of point prevalence studies. So we went to basically every vented facility in the state, and we got perirectal cultures, and instead of them um, throwing away the ventilated sputum, we took the discarded sputum, and we had Christie's lab work them up, and in essence, through that type of point prevalence, you assess what the resistance profile is of colonization, and then you extrapolate that to what the resistance profile would be of the clinical infections among that population. So, Mary, just to, to follow up on that, we've done something similar for VITA, the vaccine impact on diarrhea in Africa study, where um, stool was obtained from um, children under five who presented with moderate to severe diarrhea and their matched controls. <coughs> And each stool sample was worked up by using classical clinical microbiology to look for the you know, major um, etiologic agents of diarrhea. Um, we also look for viruses. Um, and every stool sample was also tested by TAC nano ray card. So it's a real time PCR based assay that detects multiple pathogens simultaneously. And 
you can see for each individual pathogen, um, sometimes the, the TAC assay was more sensitive in detecting particularly bacteria, say Shigella, it was much more sensitive than classical clinical microbiology, but for some other pathogens, it wasn't. It had about the same sensitivity. So you can extrapolate from that um, no incidence. Um, but ultimately, to know whether the bacteria is resistant to certain antibiotics or not, you need to have the pure bacterial culture. Um, so that's one you know, one method that is useful, but that's very expensive to do, <laughs> to use two methods um, for every single sample. But the um, other um, method can use, which was, was kind of similar to what um, Dr. Dr. Harris just mentioned, was that for the Sante study, so that this is the azithromycin study that Karen uh, Kotloff mentioned earlier, where they're going to be giving azithromycin to um, mothers during the second or third trimester and then to their, um, to their newborns. <clears throat> We're monitoring acquisition of antibiotic resistance by testing E. coli isolated from stool and strep pneumo um, from MPOP swabs. And so that's really you know, being used. Those, path those bacteria, not necessarily pathogens, those bacteria are being used as markers for antibiotic resistance. Um, the other thing that you can do is just take, use molecular methods and take, say, stool and just look for antibiotic resistance genes and look at changes over time, but then you can't, um, you know, you, you can't say which genes those bacteria um, are from. I think some of the software, the algorithms are getting better at um, assigning genes to certain bacteria, but it's still, it's still a working group. Yeah. You can always ask man to include it in the FIA, see if we can get perirectal swabs or nares swabs from everyone <laughs> we're testing for HIV in the field. <laughs> Any other questions from the audience? How long thanks, Matt. Thank you very much. It was very enjoyable.